very excited about this talk actually today. I was, uh, as usual, you start studying something in the Bible and then it just takes you down this trail of just wonder. Just, it's the greatest place ever to explore. You, you never get to the bottom of it. And uh, I came across this talk when um, I was actually working on my website actually. Decided to give my old Christian website a bit of a, t bit of a go. Try to breathe some life into it. And uh, when you're writing something online, you've got to write to what people are looking for. And one of the things that they're looking for is what did Jesus write in the sand? And uh, so I thought I'll, I'll, I'll write something around that. I'll look it up and, and investigate. I mean, there's thousands of people every month looking to what did Jesus write in the sand? And, uh, and it led me down this glorious trail uh, uh, that I've never seen before. Um, we've, we've heard the scriptures before. We've read it heaps of times. So I'll just start with the scripture in John chapter 8 and verse 1. And it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning. Now, this is going to be a, this is an aspect of the talk I want you to remember for later on. Early in the morning. So this is the first thing this day. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. Now, the point is he was in the temple the, the, the evening before. That's why it says he came again in the temple. The very evening before he was in the temple. And the reason why at this, at this point, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the reason why this was around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. This is when his, the Israelites celebrated uh, God's provision in the wilderness. You know, the manna from heaven and the, and, the, and the water from the rock. This is the time they were celebrating uh, this event during the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus was in the temple the night before, and he's in the temple early the next morning. And it's early the next morning this takes place. And, it, uh, and, he, 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 um, and all the people came unto him, he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the mist, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? I find it interesting, actually, they called him master. What a, what, what a con job that's going on here. They didn't believe him. They, 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 they discredited him everywhere they could. And now they're trying to set him up and they call him master. And, you know, and they're saying, oh, you know, Moses in the law says she should be stoned. But what do you say? And this is very interesting. This they said, tempting, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. It was a setup. It was, a, it was an entrapment. You know, they, they did this to tempt him that they might have something to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, <laughs> the amazing words, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down. I mean, he's cool, calm and collected. He gets up, he says, he without sin cast a first stone. And then he stoops back down and he writes on the ground again. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the mist. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have, they, have no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And it's just, it's a remarkable story. Right? And we can kind of get a lot out of this. And more, more probably, more than I discovered stuff I've never seen before. There's some amazing stuff in the, uh, that the Bible uncovers, in, 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 and, and this is just, a, it's going to take us down a really interesting path. So here's the big revelation. What did Jesus write in the sand? <laughs> no one knows. Ta -da! The simple fact of the matter is, no one knows. The Bible doesn't say what he wrote in the sand or the ground. It just clearly states that he did write on the ground. And it's a bit funny. I find it amusing human nature. I'm always sort of fascinated by human nature. Yeah, the scriptures tells us that Jesus has revealed to us, 
You know, Paul said, the mysteries that were hidden before the foundation of the world. We know the mysteries of life. We know everything there is to know. Yet we get fixated and fascinated on something that, oh, hang on, we don't know what he wrote on the ground. And we get fascinated by what's not revealed. When there's so many things that are revealed, we could be exploring. But nonetheless, people are interested in this. And there's some wild claims out there. There are, there are sermons out there that are based on conjecture. You know, there is no, the only other answer is pure conjecture. The simple fact is no one knows. We can all have fun with what could, what should, what might, and all the perhapses. But the plain fact is we do not know. And then to create whole fictitious sermons or books and everything over something that is unfounded, it's just not right. The fact is we don't know. However, there's a lot of fascinating gems we can glean from this passage of scripture. And we certainly can get some idea as to why Jesus wrote on the ground. And this is really going to open your eyes. This is, I just couldn't believe what I saw when I was studying this the other day. So I really hope, I really hope you get a lot out of this talk. And, and, and even, even on top of that, as I was researching this topic, as always, it leads to something else. And, 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 and that is what jumped out at me was the, the phrase, the finger of God. And, uh, and, 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 and we'll get to that later in the talk as well. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of foundational work and then we'll, we'll get into some of this really great stuff that the scriptures unreal, un, un, unveil. First of all, the Bible doesn't actually say Jesus wrote in the sand. I could have been a little bit smart there and said, I know the answer to what Jesus wrote in the sand. He wrote nothing in the sand because the Bible doesn't say the word sand. It says he wrote on the ground. And uh, almost every Bible version says Jesus wrote on the ground. And, and a couple of them say he wrote in the dust. And I've gone and checked the Greek word translated as the, as the ground. Uh, in this verse, and it's never in any place of the Bible been translated as sand. It's, it's been translated elsewhere in the Bible as earth, land, or ground. So I don't really know where, where, where the terminology comes, what did Jesus write in the sand? I don't know. It's funny how some, a statement uh, takes hold. And when I first started researching, I didn't think anything of it either. But, you know, I don't know where people get the word sand from. Not that, it's, not, not that it impacts the story at all. But it's funny how we, we just take, take a phrase and we run with it without investigating. And I just thought I'd have a look at that. Um, where he wrote on the ground. Here, we'll go and look at the concordance just to show you. Because this is important for later on. We go down to the word ground. <clears throat> In the Greek. This is your concordance. It's a bit slower on Zoom. And here it has been translated in the Bible as earth the majority of the time. Not as in the planet, but as the ground. Earth, land, ground. And a couple other spots where it's been country, world, or earthly. But pretty much the majority of the time, that word where Jesus wrote on the ground, it's, it, he wrote on the earth. It's the same thing. You pick, up, you pick up a piece of earth, you pick up a piece of ground. It's the same thing. But when, when we look into this further, it's important to realize that that could be tra translated as Jesus wrote in the earth because it ties in with some Old Testament stuff that, that's just amazing. So Jesus wrote in the earth. <clears throat> and we've just read the scripture there. So let's break it down. Let's itemize it a little bit. You know, it's, uh, it involves those dastardly scribes and Pharisees. You know, they're always out to, to get the Lord. They're, they're always out to, 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 as a roadblock to get in the road. And we itemize what they did here. They, they, brought, they brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Like it's, it, it's, it's an open and shut case, right? Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Well, what do you say? And they, the point is, they said, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. It was a trap. It was a trap. They didn't care about justice. They certainly didn't care about this woman. It didn't matter to them if she got stoned to death. She, she, she was just collateral damage in the scheme to get something on Jesus. And to the natural mind, you know, like it's seen the scribes and Pharisees have the perfect plan of a trap and in place. 
Jesus, who was known for his compassion, with many scriptures saying how he was moved with compassion, he wept, he forgave people's sins, he healed people. He did all this while obeying the law faultlessly. He was without sin, we read. But now the religious leaders have set a perfect trap. If he succumbs to their pressure and stones this woman, it would be totally contrary to who he is, and they could easily discredit him going forward. It would be a game, set, and match. No one would listen to him ever again. Why would you want to listen to this bloke for? Look what he's done. So they, they've got him. And if, he, and if he refuses to stone her, he'd be openly, openly challenging the religious leaders which is a perilous thing in those days to do anyway, and by implication, disobeying the God's law. They've left him with only two choices. And either choice would be a no-win situation for Jesus. <laughs> they must have been feeling so smug about themselves. And then Jesus does something they could not foresee. He stoops down, and with his finger, he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. You know, while he was doing it, it says, so that when they continued asking him, you could just imagine it. I got, <laughs> you could just imagine the relentless badgering and, and I've compared it to Twitter there. Just jump on Twitter. You'll see enough has changed. Mankind has not changed. If you go against the flow, they just jump on. One person over jumps on and everyone piles on and everyone condemns you. And, that, and you could just imagine, you know, the Bible describes things really well. Gnashing of teeth. That's, what it, that's all it reminds me of, this gnashing of teeth. You can, Come on, give us an answer. Or oh, don't you know the answer? Well, aren't you supposed to be the guru? They'd have been into him for this answer. And he just, he just writes on the ground and pretends he doesn't hear them. And then comes the curveball the scribes the Pharisees didn't see coming. I mean, when you think about it in the natural, he, he, he was between a rock and a hard place. There was no way out of this. But he stands up, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What amazing words. And he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. I got you, yes, he wrote on the ground twice. That could, make, that could open up more questions. Did he write something different both times? Did he just continue writing where he left off the first time? You see, it doesn't really matter what he wrote. But what matters is what it represents. And uh, we'll unravel more of that as we go on because uh, it's amazing what this could represent. And, you know, he who is without sin among you cast a first stone. That is such an enormous statement with such incredible meaning that is still a very popular phase, phrase, even our secular society today. He is without sin cast a first stone. How many times have you heard it? With non-religious people, they say that. And I was, I, I, as I've been going through various Bible studies, it's amazing how many phrases we have today in secular society from non-religious people that the sayings come from the Bible. I <laughs> just love it. And so this story is amazing. Despite the scribes and Pharisees' best efforts of entrapment, they fell into their own snare. And how many times has that happened throughout the scriptures? When someone's, a, 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 you know, when people are against the people of God and they set a trap, and they fall into the trap themselves. You know, it says, and when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And then when Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? As no man condemned thee. And she said, No man. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, the, the, the thing is here, Jesus was without sin. He could have thrown a stone at her. Because he was without sin. But he chose not to. Now, there's another little point I want to get in. People go, oh, God, God of the Old Testament is harsh. And, you know, they've got, got God the Father as some, some big bogeyman up in, uh, up in heaven. And Jesus is in front of him, the nice guy, protecting us from, the, from this angry Father. This is God in the flesh. Jesus is the express image of God. This is God the Father's judgment. This, Jesus is basically the God of the Old Testament. He said, I am. He used the phrase, I am, continually. This is how God judges. This is the fairness of God. He prefers, the Old Testament is full of scripture, says he delights in mercy. Delights in mercy. It means he, 
If you ever delighted in something, you if you delight in something, you want to do it more than anything else. If you really got a something you really delight in, you want to you want to be you want to. If you delight in fishing, you want to go fishing as many times as you like. No matter what you delight in, you want to get involved in it. Well, God delights in mercy. If He delights in it, He's going to want to show mercy as often as possible. This is the God of the Old Testament, represented in Jesus Christ. I've always said, if anyone wants to accuse me, I mean, if you find fault with me, just don't look too hard. No, it's not hard. You'll find fault with me. But if you find fault with me, please drag me before Jesus and not before men. Let him judge. And, uh, and you know, when we're witnessing to people, people can uh, say, oh, you're judging me. and you, you, you shouldn't be saying these things. or whatever. We're not judging you at all. We just want to bring you before Jesus. We want to bring you before the most fairest person that you're ever going to get a hearing from. Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, the scriptures tells us in Roman free time, none of us are without sin. None of us can throw stones or condemn others. But we, you know, like there's a story years ago. I'm already off track, but anyway, there was a story years ago. I used to work with this guy, these guys out at the, the Woolscow, and we worked in separate departments. And this guy was on the outer all the time. And everyone picked on him and were being mean to him. So I tried to be friends with this before I was in the Lord. I just, I just wanted, wanted to treat this guy, what, what guy better. And they were going, oh, he stinks and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, you mean people. Anyway, one day it's pouring down rain. And this is, this is uh, you know, it's about five or seven kilometers away from home. It's out of town. And I used to walk or run. And uh, this day it's pouring down rain. So he offered me a lift. So I got a lift with this guy. And I thought, you know, how nice. I guarantee <laughs> it's freezing cold, it's pouring down rain, the windows are up. Within 100 metres, I'm gasping. He, I've never smelled anything like it in my life. This guy stunk. He, be, he beyond stunk. It was like the air was thick. I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to offend, I don't want to offend the guy, you know. I lasted another 100 metres. I had to wind the window down. I said, oh, man, for some reason I'm hot, you know. I just made up the story. And I never got to lift home with him again. I never told him the truth. And I was just thinking about this guy the other day. I did him a disservice. I should have told him he stunk as nicely as possible because he's gone through the rest of his life without friends. He's gone through the rest of his life not realizing he stinks. And really, that's what it's like when we're, <laughs> when we're witnessing the people. I'm sorry, anyone in the world who's watching this, but you stink. And we just want to nicely point out to you <laughs> that you're on the nose. And uh, <laughs> You know, it's like it's like it's like the it's like the coronavirus, isn't it? You, you you might have it and not even know. A lot of people have things that they don't know. This guy didn't know he stunk, and we're not interested in throwing more mud at you. We're not interested in judging you. We're not interested in throwing mud at you and making you dirtier. You're already dirtier. You're already dirty. We just want to bring you to the car wash, Jesus Christ. We just want to take you to a place where you, you can be cleaned up and not smell anymore. So, anyway, I don't know how that come up. Now, popular opinion, and I got caught up with this uh, when I first wrote this article, <coughs> that uh, uh, the, the, they go into the Greek, and, and I don't believe it's true, that uh, this, 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 this word, uh, he without sin, means he without sin in this matter. And of course, they were with sin in this matter, on, 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 on face value, because they dragged the woman before Jesus. In the process, they did not bring the man. Found, found sleeping with her, and they bypass all the legal requirements of a fair trial. So in this matter, in their, in their self-righteousness and their, and their enraged, you know, carry on about keeping the law, they themselves broke the law in this very matter. But however, I was going for a walk down the night, and I was just thinking about it, and I'm thinking, well, you know what? This, <laughs> this too is presumptuous. We assumed that they dragged her to Jesus as soon as, as she was caught. However, the Bible doesn't really say that. Who's to say she wasn't caught the night before or earlier in the week? Who's to say she didn't go to trial? Who's to say that the man involved also wasn't taken to the trial? He could have been led for action. He could have already been dead. He could have been being stoned later on. <laughs> it was on their way to stone her that they dragged her before Jesus. So it is possible all of the legal requirements were met. 
And uh, sometimes we make up a lot of doctrine from what we presume happened. There's nowhere in the scriptures that says that in the Greek, it seems to apply that, that it refers to their sin in this case. You look, up, you look it up in the Greek. The simple face value of it is he without sin cast the first stone, which has led many to, many to speculate that Jesus, what, what he wrote on the ground was the Ten Commandments. The first time he writes down five commandments, he stands up, he without sin cast the first stone, he stands, squats back down, he writes the other five commandments. I mean, when you squat down right on the ground, there's not many things, you, that's not a great big space you can write on. So whatever it was, it's, yeah, we can only speculate, but that's of course people to speculate that. You've got the Ten Commandments there, well, he without sin, who hasn't broken one of these, cast the first stone. And if you're honest, no one can say that they can. But the thing is here, you know, the, the temple was a big place. Jesus in the temple here teaching. And they've come out of a place in the temple with this woman. So th she could have come straight out of the trial. You know, he was, there's an outer court, and there's an inner court. We just think of a temple as one little, like our church, one, one little room. But this had a lot, a, lot of, a lot of spaces. You had the outer temple where the Gentiles could gather. You had the inner temple. You had all these different places. So she could have been very well just come out of the trial. So again, it's an assumption to say that they actually didn't bring them in, that they didn't, you know, troll just that the bible doesn't say and therefore some speculation goes rife after that and we assume a lot of things anyway the exciting stuff why did jesus write on the ground okay we've done the groundwork oh i'll show you the picture that's some guy dressed up as jesus with dirty feet riding on the ground so why did jesus write on the ground and we go to jeremiah 17 which i've got down here but it's in this photo in this picture oh lord the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Woo because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. That's Jeremiah 17, 13. Who's written on the ground? Who's written in the earth? Remember that scripture, that word ground, most of the time is translated as earth. That's the same word in the Old Testament there. I'm pointing to it, no one can see. Uh, you know, it's the same word written there. They who forsake the Lord get their name written in the ground, get their name written in the earth. You know, <laughs> we get our name written in the book of life. You either have your name written in the book of life or you have your name written in the earth. This is a big thing. And then it says here the hope of Israel. We'll, we'll, read, we'll cover this a bit more, but Jesus is the hope of Israel. Oh, I just hit the wrong button. Jesus wrote on the ground, and Jesus is the fountain of living waters. He fulfills everything in Jeremiah 17. Everything in that verse. The hope of Israel, <coughs> the writing on the earth, the fountain of living waters. It's not coincidence. So we go through this. So, so we see this example writing on the ground. All those that part from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord. That's the serious thing. <laughs> and I don't believe it's coincidental because the verse also refers, to, oh, okay, because this verse also refers to the Lord as a fountain of living waters. <laughs> you know what I said, take note that um, it happened first thing the next morning, all right? The woman was brought to him that morning. So that morning, the first thing early in the morning, he's riding on the ground. Well, the day before, the last thing in the evening, on the day, on, on the Feast of Tabernacles, on the last day, Jesus gets up in John 7, verse 37 and 38. So this is the previous chapter, the previous evening. This is the last thing that happened before he rode on the ground with the woman the next day. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So this is the... this. Again, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a big deal. This is the, this is the feast where they are remembering. <laughs> it was dedicated to the remembrance of Israel's sojourn in the wilderness and God's miraculous provision. And, we, and his most miraculous provision was manna from heaven and water from the rock. <laughs> and now, go back to Jeremiah. The fountain of living waters. They who have forsaken the Lord, who was the fountain of living waters. The very night before he wrote on the ground, he tells them all, he is the fountain of living waters. He that, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He is the source of living water. So he's made that declaration. They'd have, 
that had been all uh, sort of coming to them. They'd have been putting two and two together here. They don't own the scripture in Jeremiah. So I got here. So get this. <laughs> on this very day, on this very day, of last day of this feast, he declares he's the fountain of living water. We also know Jesus is the rock. The rock that followed them was Christ. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And the rock was the source of water. Jesus is the rock and the real source of water. Moses, representing the law, struck the rock. Water come here. But Jesus died because of the law. The rock was struck because of the law. Out of Jesus' death and resurrection comes water, rivers of living water. Where, he, where, where it's just a, it's just amazing. That's why Moses couldn't enter into the promised land because he represented the law. Only grace could take you into the promised land. I've got to, but wait, there's more. Sounds like um, trying to sell steak knives. In John six, verse thirty. Now this is the previous chapter. This is the same week. It's, just, it's during this Feast of Tabernacles. In a discussion about the manna from heaven, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. This is the very time they're celebrating the manna from heaven, <laughs> miraculous water provision. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. He, he talks about the thirst again. <laughs> in this very, very feast, seven days of this feast, and he says, hey, it all comes it all comes from me i'm the bread of life i'm the source of water you know it all happened in three consecutive chapters just just let's, let's just itemize it again to take it in it's a time of the feast in remembrance of god's great provision for israel in their journey through the wilderness manna from heaven water from the rock were the main forms of provision jesus declares he's the real bread from heaven jesus declares he's the fountain of living waters Jesus writes on the ground. Consecutive days. <clears throat> uh, I think the religious leaders would have known exactly what Jesus was doing by writing on the ground. You just put yourselves in their mind. They, they, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe he was Messiah. But the, I mean, momentum was gathering. People were, people were believing he was the Messiah. He was declare, you know, he was the Messiah. And, and if, if there was any truth to this, if there was any truth to this, well, he's the Messiah who says he's the bread of heaven, who says he's the fountain of living waters, who's riding on the ground to those who oppose him. They'd have got it big time. That <laughs> would have been scary if they knew that. They would have known that scripture. That scripture's read out during some of their feasts. They'd have known that scripture from a child in Jeremiah, that the hope of Israel. And, uh, and even, even more, in Acts 28, verse 20, Paul talking in his defense it says, For this course, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And, uh, you know, back in Jeremiah 17, it starts with, O Lord, the hope of Israel. Paul's in chains because of the hope of Israel. He was preaching Jesus Christ. And Paul would have known the Old Testament better than most. He, he equated Jesus as being the hope of Israel. So we have Jesus Christ fulfilling every word of Jeremiah 17, 13. He is the hope of Israel. He's the source of living water where you'll never thirst again, riding on the ground when people were railing at him and rejecting him. I will see that, well, you know, uh, uh, hope of Israel. Um, I think Simeon, yeah, Simeon's the guy's name. I'm, I'm really uh, amazed by this guy in the scriptures. I'm just looking him up here. It was a time when Jesus was born. Let's go back. Here we go. Let's pick it up in Luke. Luke 2.25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. He's waiting for the consolation. This is the hope of Israel. Jesus, this was Jesus when he was, a, he was brought into the temple. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see, the, see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What an amazing thing. He never saw anything that the Lord's Christ had done. He never saw his life unravel, but he was just a happy man to see that he arrived on the scene. Now that's definitely describing a hope of Israel. And he came by the spirit of the temple when the parents brought the child to Jesus, uh, child Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law. And then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, "Lord, 
Now let us, thou servant, depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. I'm envious of this guy. What a happy, happy person. He was just happy to see the consolation and the hope of Israel. You know, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. That's the hope of Israel. Salvation is the hope of Israel. Jesus Christ is the hope. And he goes on and says, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph, his mother, marveled at those things which he has spoken. And Simeon blessed them, said unto Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rise again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Boy, do they speak against him and so on. But here's this guy. That's just, if that's not the hope of Israel, what is? Jesus Christ is the hope of Israel. And so he fulfills that. We'll go back up here just to read that again. Jeremiah, O Lord, the hope of Israel. Jesus Christ. All that forsake thee, all that forsake Jesus Christ shall be ashamed. And they that depart from Jesus Christ shall be written in the earth. You know what happens when you're written in the earth? It's loose. The wind comes and your name's just erased forever. That's why it's important to have your, your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you only get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life if you're born again. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. You could substitute the name of Jesus Christ all the way through that. He is the hope of Israel. He is the fountain of the living waters. And when he wrote it on the ground, and get this, some speculate that he might have wrote their names. Now, if you, if you know that scripture, and he's the guy who's called the Messiah, who's just declared himself to be the, uh, the source of living water, the bread from heaven, the hope of Israel, and he's writing your name in the dirt and the ground when you oppose him. Boy, howdy. <laughs> a speculation, but it certainly scare you. So now we come to another thing, the finger of God. You know how you read scriptures? You can read a scripture. I don't know how many times I've heard this story about God's forgiveness, the, the woman caught in adultery. I don't know how many times I've read it. And I was reading it the other day, and just that, that, that phrase he wrote on the ground with his finger. You, know, you think, well, big deal. But it just leapt out at me. You know, I had the realization that this is the finger of God. God in the flesh. The express image, Jesus Christ, the express image of God. This is the finger of God writing on the ground. I missed something back here. Well, it doesn't matter. But, you know, <laughs> it reminds us, the first thing, I, I'm assuming anyone, anyone here who's been around for a while, the first thing you would think of when something was written by the finger of God would be the Ten Commandments. You know, uh, back in Exodus 31, 18, it says, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, I just, to get a, true, a real appreciation of, of the Bible, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament go, go over each other. The Old Testament is like a foundation and the New Testament blueprint goes over it. And a lot of things said in the Old Testament are rephrased in different words maybe, but they're the same things in the New Testament. It's like this blueprint and it's all fulfilled for Jesus Christ. And here we have the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. Now it might be just coincidence, it might be reading too much into this, but Jesus wrote it on the ground two times. He got up, got up, he wrote, got down, he wrote something, got up and said, he without sin cast first stone, went back down, wrote something else. So, you know, was it the Ten Commandments he was writing? Did he write five and then write another five? Was it the same finger of God <laughs> writing both times? <laughs> but it's important that the first was brought to us by Moses and the second was brought to us by Jesus. One, the first one, the law, demands death. And that was typified by the demanding of the death of the adulterous woman. You know, they wanted her dead. That was what the law does. The second, Jesus Christ, brings in grace and truth. And this is typified by, by him saying, neither do I condemn thee. This, was, this story is a clash between the law and grace. I hope you can see that. It was, a, it, was, it was a demonstration of a clash between law and grace. And grace 
is more powerful than law. It wins. You know, it says the, uh, uh, the letter killeth. There's no bending the law. There's no bending in the law. You know, it's really typified. The law is really typified by, written, be written, by being written on stone tablets. You know, they're, they're unbendable. They're just, and they just create hassles. Any law, not even a, not only God's law, any law. I mean, you bring in a rule at work and it becomes this rule that people just want people punished over if, if it's not upheld. And even though, you know, there's certain circumstances that might, you know, it's a good general rule. Then once it becomes once it becomes a law, it just. I was thinking the other day actually, when <clears throat> talking about law, there was a twenty years ago, maybe even less. Well, actually, when I was a kid, let's go way back. Let's go back millions of years. When I was a kid, I remember my parents speaking very highly of this football coach, and one of the greatest things this guy did was bring all the kids home in the back of his ute. He was a hero. Fast forward, a couple of years ago, I heard him talking at work. This guy who trains his soccer team did the same thing. He brought all the kids home in the back of his ute. They wanted to kill him. They wanted him to go to jail. It was the worst thing anyone could ever do <laughs> because now it's become a law. Now we know, now we know it's dangerous. Well, yeah, a kid might fall out and hit his head whatever but here's the thing once once something gets written down once something becomes a law what before the law the person's a hero after the law they want to lock him up and kill him and this is what the, this is what rules this is what law can do you know rules are a part of life i mean you've got to have rules for, for car parking or whatever rules are a part of life but mercy and grace should be a part of life as well now the thing that excited me here we'll just go on to the finish bit and it's, it's exciting. It's, this is mind-blowing. <laughs> the finger of God. You know, I said, I read the scriptures hundreds of times, and for some reason, the finger of God jumped out at me. And in Luke, in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, it says, but Jesus said, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come unto you. Now, let's look at it. Luke 11. Luke 11, verse 20. Here, here it is. But the previous verse says, And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do you, your sons cast them out? Therefore shall, therefore shall they be your judges. But I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Now, I just want to go to the concordance. Just, uh, this, is, this is Luke. This is what Luke has written. Let's go to the word finger. There's, look up the Greek word, just to prove a point, and it can only mean finger, right? Finger, finger. It's the only possible uh, translation of this Greek word is finger. Let's go. Same story. I'm assuming it's the same story. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Let's go and have a look at Matthew 12, 28. And I assume it's the same instance. Maybe it happened more than once and it was worded this way. So this is Matthew. So Luke says the finger of God. Matthew 12, 28, I think it was. Same story. See, it says, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils. So it sounds like the same story. And then he says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And just to look at that spirit of God, by the spirit, well, it's from the Greek word humor. You all know what that is straight away. It definitely means spirit. Right? There's no, it can't mean anything else. Spirit, spirit, Holy Ghost, so forth. So that's what, that's what it means here. The book was, the book of the Bible was inspired by the Holy Ghost. It was written by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost in the book of Luke, I've got Matthew there. In the, uh, there might be Matthew. But anyway, in one book, it says the Spirit of God. And then this other book, it says it's the finger of God. To the disciples' mind, to the Holy Ghost's mind, the finger of God is exactly the same as the Spirit of God. I, want, I really want you to get this. The Spirit of God is exactly the same 
as the Spirit of God. Did I say finger of God first? Finger of God, same as Spirit of God. The other reference we have to the finger of God is during the um, during the plagues in, in Egypt. You know how the plague would come and the magicians would get together and they could replicate what was happening. So they got to a point where they couldn't replicate what was happening anymore. And when, when, when one of the plagues come in Exodus 8, 19, they turned around and said, the magician said, <laughs> said to Pharaoh, man, this is out of our league. This is the finger of God. So the finger of God's always always associated with the power of God. And so is the Holy Spirit. It's always associated with the power of God. I've got another little graphic there. Sometimes it's easier to see <laughs> in, in picture form. But the finger of God is the Holy Spirit. And, and we've read the two scriptures. But then it gets really, really interesting. <laughs> we know the scripture in Ephesians 1.13, right? And we're remembering the finger of God is the same as the spirit of God. And Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise or the finger of God. The word sealed, we know it means stamped, the, the, the king's signet, all this sort of stuff. It's got a lot of meanings to be sealed. But if you dwell right down, one of the meanings is signature. <laughs> The, we have God's signature. When you, when you receive the Holy Spirit, the finger of God, God's signature, your name is written down in the book of life rather than the book of earth. You have God's, God's finger and it gets better. God's finger has written his laws in our hearts. Hebrews 8.10 for all, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, say the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me. How does he write them in their hearts? We know it's when you receive the Holy Spirit, the finger of God. He actually writes them on our heart. It's amazing. And it doesn't get any clearer to this, this scripture. I love it. You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of your heart. <laughs> I really hope you're getting this. Epistle means letter. You know, before texting, young ones out there, you, we used to write letters. You used to, used to be, and, and to explain what a letter is, it used to be a piece of paper you used to write on with ink. And you put it in an envelope and the mailman would deliver it to whoever you wanted to go. And they would open up and read the letter. Well, what he's saying is that we are living letters. <laughs> That's what epistle means. It means a letter. We are living letters. Not <laughs> written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. We are written letters written by the finger of God. <laughs> uh, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to just go... How many wows can you? Yeah, you know, people think we're written. We're, our heart has been written by the finger of God. Yeah, you know, people think we're touched. They they got no idea how touched we really are. The finger of God is imprinted upon us, and it's such such a blessing. Amen. And I'll hand over to Ross, who's going to lead us into communion.